How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Stretch the canvas, brush with madness. Is it sadness or just a show? Then go, 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 go. Then go, 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 go. Then go, 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 go. Welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Marilyn Monroe swallowed a pill. Did she do it for love? Very nice. That's nice. Yeah. Um, do you have allergies? I mean, because because you still have all that vocal tone and everything. So many people these days are like sniffly, at least. Not you, huh? I do have allergies. I don't currently. Uh, I'm not sur- currently suffering from those allergies. I typically get them in the beginning of the season. Mm. with the pollen and then at the end of the season with the ragweed but right now i'm I'm feeling pretty good dr joe well it sounded great as always yeah nice, nice to be with you again you know it's always fun mark always a great time and always an incredible introduction so, well i appreciate you very much dr joe thank you for saying that tom i wonder if you can introduce our guest for tonight oh of course of course dr joe tonight we have Ms. Liz Kitchens. Liz Kitchens is a rare and endangered species born and raised in Orlando, Florida. Her memories of the salty scrubbiness of the landscape and the sweet scent of orange blossoms predates Walt Disney World. This geographical legacy, sandwiched between the frolicking waters of the Atlantic Ocean and Gulf Coast, inspired her playful spirit and informs her writing. Liz is the author of Be Brave, Lose the Beige, Finding Your Sass After 60, published by She Writes Press in May of 2023. Her blog, Be Brave, Lose the Beige, focuses on issues facing lady boomers, women of the baby boomer generation. She is a contributing writer for the online magazine 60 and Me, and has been published in various online and print publications. Liz conducts workshops and seminars on creativity and is available in person or virtually for speaking engagements and workshops. She is married, the mother of three adult children, and the grandmother of three grandchildren. Welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Welcome, you. Liz Kitchens. How are you? I am I am very happy to be here. So I, I'm honored that you invited me. Oh, we are absolutely delighted. It, it's a it's a great book. Be brave, lose the beige. Tell us first of all, what was the inspiration for you writing this book? Well, it's twofold. The first um, is really about. I, I'm a big fan of a Catholic theologian, Richard Rohr. I don't know if you know that name. Um, He wrote a lot about falling upwards. He writes about um, the first and second halves of life. He's not the only one. Carl Jung uh, wrote about it. And David Brooks, New York Times uh, writer, wrote a book called The Second Mountain. And actually, my son and I have talked a lot about the second half of life. Hmm. And that Real, I will say that is one of the inspirations uh, for writing this book because, I mean, it's 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 neat to say first and second half of life, and there's certainly a, a lot of dimension to that. But in the first half of life, we focus on establishing our identities. Uh, it's a lot about ego, how we appear to the world. Um, we make mo- we earn money, we have children, we pay a mortgage, and so we're very focused on that. And many many, many countries in the world, are, you know, are, uh, remain in that first half of life because it's about survival. But in the second half of life, if we have the luxury of pondering that, um, we're charged with <clears throat> determining what, uh, what's inside these carefully crafted containers that we have built. And this is the time in our lives when we have the opportunity to find meaning and purpose. Hmm. And I, I I love that. Instead, we often get mired down in finding a perfect state of wellness. And we stay there a lot of times. And, um, and that makes us kind of unhappy and dissatisfied if that's what we look at. And if we get really focused on these broken body parts and figuring out our financial future futures, which of course we have to do, um, 
but so we're just bound to experience some negative things and but it's how we react to these negative things that causes the damage and so you know the ancient philosophers advised us to do what we can with what we have and that sounds pretty simple but um you know if we do that um then you know maybe we can find some version of happiness mm -hmm. so that was kind of my my son-in-law as my son and I who is he's a psychologist we talked a lot about that he actually wrote his dissertation on this topic um on generativity mm -hmm. and I wrote a book about it and so that's kind of the first part and the second reason is I'm a blogger and my blog is Be Brave, Lose the Beige. And I started writing that in like 2009 when I was 56 years old. And at that time, I started talking about issues like empty nest syndrome, boomerang kids. And my target audience uh, was lady boomers, as I call us, since I most certainly fit that age demographic. And um, so I kind of shared some pretty candid stories about you know what I was going through kind of in a way to help other women similarly situated know they weren't they're not alone I regularly throw my family under the bus I've yeah. I've forbidden my children and my former husband from reading my book um <laughs> because they're they're pretty they're pretty candid and I use you know I I do I throw them under the bus it's kind of tongue-in-cheek humor and then, you know, the the pandemic happened and we were sequestering in place if we were lucky enough to do so. And so I kind of turned these blogs into a book. Mm. So that's kind of the, the inspiration um, for writing this book. That's terrific. And this perfect sense of wellness, can you say a bit more about that and how that influences us? I give a lot of examples in my book. Um, I mean, I, I another inspiration for writing the book was uh, the knee replacements, uh, and i i had a I had a bum knees, bow legged bum knees, and so the, I had a knee replacement done in 2019, and I woke up with a drop foot, and that's pretty discouraging. <laughs> so it's like, and it's frightening, and you don't know if you're going to recover from that. And um, spent some dark moments, but I started writing about it and, and I started finding, you know, I just started finding some silver linings um, and, and I broke a lot of body parts back then. I had, I, I broke an elbow, I broke a wrist. And so we are going to face things like this, but it's how we navigate them um, that makes meaning in our life and makes our life you know have quality um and so these are things that i've shared with people my dark moments or my in my my readers and um and people seem it seemed to resonate and i got subscribers and they were positive about some of the things i said and how the orthopedist um was an you know had the intelligence of an eggplant and I um so I was pretty candid and so they liked it and so that's kind of that perfect state of I just think we we have our 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 minds set on that goal and if it doesn't happen or if we deviate from that or if we do get a you know a drop foot how we manage that is is the real meaning of our life yeah um so. Yeah, and, and and that's why I think it resonates so well. It's part of why we wanted you onto the show because that really is very much an I am approach. I mean, we're doing the best we can. If we don't like it, we can change it. But rather than dwell on this and judge it as negative, and broken, and less valuable, let's look again at you know who we are, why we do what we do. So um, I, I just want to spend a moment just talking about the subtitle of the book. Finding your sass after 60. I got to know more about that. Well, as I mentioned to you when I was talking to you earlier, I um, 
I'm very, I'm honored to be among men because most of my interviews have been with women. <laughs> and um, in other instances, that's why I, I think this is must be a highly evolved show because <laughs> um, in the past, when I have mentioned my blog or when I mentioned the name of my book, I've had men look at me quizzically. I mean, I know some evolved men too. My husband is one of those. Um, not my former husband, but my current husband. Um, <laughs> uh, he's actually, I have a subchapter called Dump the Dude. Um, and so I I received this text uh, from my former husband and to, to me and my children. And he said, why am I forbidden from reading this book? And I was like, oh, I, it's hyperbole. I, I'm, you can, you're welcome to read it. There's nothing, but I, I probably would not really want him to, uh, to read it, but um, tell me your question again. I just kind of got off, off, off. Finding your sass, finding your sass after 60. Well, and so many of the, the men have said, is it about makeup? Is it about fashion? Uh -huh. And I was like, no, it's really not. It's, you know, women, women have lived uh within um a lot of I, I encourage women to color outside the lines that's a big part of this um and i they've lived we have lived our lives within the constraints of a lot of rules our kindergarten teachers admonishment to color inside the lines i think has kind of um have has kind of uh, directed how we live our lives and so I, well, and I'll read you something. I think it's easier to um, read you this. It's called an ode to beige, which might help explain um, this, this uh, book. And that kind of will tell you what the title means. Meet beige. Beige is reliable, practical, sensible, and safe. Beige doesn't put up a fuss. It is very accommodating and goes with everything. Beige is conflict averse. It follows the rules, blends in, and avoids standing out. Now meet Magenta. Magenta and her sister jewel tones are rich, dynamic, loud, sometimes garish, and not easily overlooked. Magenta doesn't always mix well with others. Magenta is hard to ignore. Beige is endorsed, even encouraged, by our society. Governing bodies prefer their citizens in beige. Too many screaming magentas and shrieking yellows, and there's trouble in River City. Or so we're told. But maybe some rebellion is warranted at this stage in our lives. The biggest danger intrinsic to being beige is that it precludes creative thinking. Armed with a beige brush, our purses and sofas aren't the only items we color vanilla. We also tend to beige up our choices, goals, and life strategies. And that is serious stuff. Um, so I've kind of anthropomorphized um, color in my book. I've made them characters yeah. with beige being set up in a contest with magenta. And so that's part of it. And so, I really, it's a call to, to women to kind of trot out their inner magenta and, and live their lives that way because, and because we've lived within a lot of rules. And I think, and, and so I talk a lot about breaking rules, fine print rules. In fact, um, my friends and family have accused me of um, thinking rules are just suggestions. Well, but I, I, I think that, you know, there's always room to break rules if you have the right rules to break. We do have a rule though that we rarely break and that is giving our sponsors an opportunity to talk about their colorful products. So let's do that. Let's take a break. We'll hear from our sponsors and we'll be right back with Liz Kitchens and explore more. Brave, lose the beige. Hey folks, thank you for listening to the Dr. Joe Show. We've been investigating whether or not we want to bring sponsors into our podcast. What are your thoughts? Do you know somebody who might be a good partner with the Dr. Joe Show, who may want to align their product or service with the Dr. Joe Show? Think about it. And we're back with the Dr. Joe Show with author Liz Kitchens talking about her book, Be Brave, Lose the Beige. 
finding your sass, your sass, Dr. Joe, after 60. Yeah. And, and you know, before the break, we heard a wonderful poem and, and exploring you know, a lot of, I think, the motivation behind the book and, and the messaging to people. Um, guys, any any thoughts about this? Remember, we're... Well, I liked how we were finishing up um, the rules versus suggestions, right? I've heard somebody refer to it as there's rules and then there's real rules, right? I think this definitely extends all genders. Mm. You know, there are there are as many beige men as there are beige women, but I imagine there are a, quite a large community of, of, of beige women uh, that are boomers, right? I think generationally the it, it's evolving right so that uh commercial that you saw in the 50s where the woman was to be home cooking dinner and having that dinner ready for father when he got home like that's oh, the, his... the anjali perfume commercial yeah i can i can make the whatever and fry it up in the pan and never oh, yeah. never never let him forget he's a man that's in my, my book too because <laughs> <'Cause laughs> i'm a woman right yes 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 i remember yeah, that well and i think i think boomer women um kind of were you know put in a pickle uh we we're kind of the tweener generation where our mothers kind of had their thwarted dreams i know my mother did and i know friends of my mother from mothers of friends of mine um had that experience too where like my mother wanted to be an opera singer. <laughs> so, and it said she had four kids. And so, she, so I was the only daughter and she kind of put that on me, like be what I couldn't be. Hmm. And yet you better have kids and, um, and you better be like I am with you. I'm the best Christmas mom there is. And so that laid the predicate for a lot of guilt. And, um, so we were, you know, that's, so our children were the latchkey kids and that's a really great com, you know, commentary on our generation. And, um, and so I, I, I spend a lot of time in a chapter about the kind of parents we are, <laughs> how enabling we are. And I, I mean, that's where I really threw my kids under the bus because I, I laugh at myself a lot for, yeah. um, I even, you know, throughout the book, I have, um, um, maxims, as I call them. And at the end, they're collected a, as an appendices um, called the BBLB Manual of Maxims, BBLB being for Be Brave, Lose the Beige. And, you know, one of, you know, I have 35 of them. I could go through them with you if you were bored. But uh, <laughs> one of them is, yes, your children's shit does stink. I mean, it's just, and we, and, and the way we have behaved in the course of our parenthood, is uh, you wouldn't know we really think that way because boundaries have not been our strong suit. So, I mean, it's really put us, I mean, I, you know, I, in fact, I'm a, I'm a numbers junkie. My husband and I have a market research firm and for 35 years, I've been a pollster. That's why I know that there's a margin, margin of error for rules and plus or five, plus or minus 5% on the rule thing, not too far afield, but just a little bit of rule breaking um, and I've collected a lot of data on baby boomer women and what they care about. And, um, I, I've done a lot of surveys and so that's sprinkled throughout the book, but I know we are 911 on our adult children's cell phones. I know we are caregivers often for three and four generations, simul sometimes simultaneously, our parents, our, our partners now, our kids, our grandchildren, and we have this pathological propensity to please. Mm. Uh, and so that zaps our sass. <laughs> mm. And I mean, I was just up in Chicago. Uh, cons I, I, I laughingly use the word conscripted. Um, I was caring for my darling grandchildren, which is a joy. Of course, it totally is. I'm crazy about them, but it's a lot of work. Um, you know, I found when I was writing my book, I, everything stops when I get a FaceTime or a call or an, an SOS to come to Chicago. Mm. And so it, you know, it, we postponed ourselves. We have postponed ourselves for a lot of 
our lives. And you're right, Mark, it, it, this is not exclusive of women. I mean, men certainly have faced these same um, things, but I don't know that much about men. I, this is what I know. And, and I can write about what I know. And that's what I did with my blog. I wrote about what I know with some self-deprecation because, I mean, we're crazy sometimes and we do really crazy things. And, you know, we, and, and we spend so much money on our children, you know, and their student loan debt and all that kind of stuff. Cause they, you know, my children both came out of, you know, one a PhD and another an MFA and they had a lot of student loan debt. And so we want to help them. And so that means less money for us in our retirement accounts. And so we can't stop working. And so it, it really has this, it creates a conundrum. Yeah, I, and, I um, absolutely hear that, especially in, in context of the wonderful oxymoron, adult children. I mean, it's just one of the best juxtapositions ever. I I, I, I also have four adult children and um, I, I think it's, it's a really interesting dilemma that, that you highlight and you do it so well because you use humor. It's not you know, humor is such a diffusing way of exploring what are very difficult topics. So I, I certainly appreciate that. You, you're, you know, the, um, the chapters and, and the sub chapters within them are, are very compelling. But before we go further, how do people get the book, Liz? Thank you for say, asking that question. Barnes and Noble has a Amazon has a target. I mean, anywhere online, it's it's available because it is through She Writes Press, uh, who's the publisher. Um, so it's pretty, it's very available. Good, good, good. So people, you you know, you can find it uh, on all the different sites, uh, and it's it's just come out recently, just a month or so ago. May, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, it's hot off the press, baby. Hot <laughs> off the press. So I want to I want to get to the first question, which is the chapter, the subchapter, abolish Mother's Day. Can you just <laughs> tell us a bit more about that? I would love to. I'm so glad. <laughs> I think Mother's Day. I think well. I can't speak for every woman, but I've talked to a number. I've done surveys on this. Um, it's such a lot of pressure because you have to uh, be adequately appreciative of the appreciation your children show you. And if you don't have the proper reaction, then you're screwed. <laughs> and generally, uh, Mother's Day, I mean, First of all, it, it it should have its own date. I mean, it, because the date moves around, the Sunday moves around. And so then you have to kind of hope your kids remember that this date is coming up. And it's true for Father's Day. I, 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 I'm quick to say that. But um, so then, you know, then you kind of hope do the flowers come on the, you know, in a timely fashion or the card or whatever. And then you spend a lot of time, then you have a mother and you have daughter-in-laws or daughters who are mothers and it's just fraught with complication. So I think just get rid of it. It's a Hallmark holiday. Who cares about it? Just let, yeah. let them celebrate your birthday or something. It's just ripe for disappointment. You know, a, a quick example. I was talking to my grandson um, shortly before Mother's Day. And I said, Rue, what are you getting mom for mo Mother's Day? He was, I guess he would have been five then. Um, and he said, I don't know, but I'm getting a Harry Potter Lego set. And I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and the beat goes on. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so the kids get presents on Mother's Day. The, at least my grandchildren do. Um, so it's just kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. And and really, to to have to have one particular day of appreciation is sort of silly. I mean, I'd like to think that mothers are appreciated every day. Mm -hmm. Because really, we have so much. I mean, we wouldn't, none of us would be here without a mother, so... You know, and the other thing is it makes other women feel bad who mm -hmm. don't, who have chosen not to have children or women whose children live far away oh. and they're not with their kids. And it's, 
it's just a lot of, it's a lot. And so was that one of the blogs that you had posted around Mother's Day several years ago and then incorporated into the book? Well, truth be told, I've probably written three or four blogs on different Mother's Day, you know, mm -hmm. the Mother's Day blues. I know yeah. I can remember one of them. Another one was a good one. It was called um, for Mother's Day. I got a I, I got a rose for Mother's Day. And that was the day I found out my son and daughter in law were pregnant. And then Maya Rose was my it was my first grandchild. And so that was a good one, but I've, I've written a number of them. So that, that I felt merited a sub chapter in my book. Hmm. Yeah. Again, folks, uh, be brave, lose the beige by Liz kitchens. It's absolutely great read should pick it up. The, um, the other part is at the end of the chapters, there are these exercises which I think are, are a wonderful way to tap into people's creative process. Can you talk a little bit about the inspiration for any of those? I, especially the one I like, your story in six words. I think that may be the first one. Thank you for, you know, thank you for asking about that. Thank you for, have re thank you for having read it. I, I'm honored. Um, I am a creativity evangelist. Um, I uh, just really believe that creativity and creative thinking help us navigate, especially these this aging journey. And that's that's when I talk about rule breaking and stuff. That's part of that's part of creative thinking. It's just stepping outside the norm a little bit. Um, I could read you a, a little sub chapter called the three fisted drinker, but which talks a little bit more about just stepping outside the norm or conventions. And um, however, uh, and so I, I, you can't just snap your fingers and say, I'm going to be creative. I'm going to think creatively, just like any other exercise, any other endeavor, you have to exercise, you have to practice. And so at the conclusion of each chapter, I have an exercise your creativity practice just to try to help people to start activating those creative muscles so, because sometimes somehow after the age of 10, we stop deeming them to be important and or silly. And, but just like our exercising our bodies or our minds, I mean, there's no question that we know that taking classes or learning a new language is really important or working out at the gym or doing yoga but somehow, after, you know, we just don't give the same credence to creativity. And that's how you, that's how you make, you know, that's how you get in the driver's seat of this second half of our lives. Mm. That's, that's how you do it. And so I, I use color and creativity kind of as a Trojan horse yeah. to, to help people understand this concept I, and how important it is. I, I think it's so and important. It, and, and, and I, I have a story in six words I'd like to share quickly. Um, I rely on our creative sponsors. And so with that in mind, I would like to take a commercial break and we will be right back with the Dr. Joe Show. Hey folks, welcome back. So any thoughts? Do you listen to other podcasts? Do you see how they do the sponsors? Is there a way that they're utilizing sponsors that you enjoy or you don't enjoy? I listen to Smartless and I really enjoy how the co-hosts share the voiceover for the product or service. It's really funny for the most part, but it's unique. It's them really endorsing. Does that work? What do you think? And we're back with the Dr. Joe show with author Liz Kitchens, author of Be Brave, Lose the Beige, Finding Your Sass after 60. Liz, I have a question. You get vulnerable in your writings. You get vulnerable in your blogs, in your books. You talk about uh, maybe the family ought not read these. When did you find the courage to put yourself out there? Was there a moment that you said, you know what? I'm here. Hear me roar. I, that's such a good question, Mark. Um, I, I think age did that. <laughs> what I age? Think, you know, 50, 
I started writing my blog in 2009 when I was 56. And I think, I think your fifties are just such a great age because you get, you feel a little more empowered yeah. and it would be great if 60 was say, everyone's, if 60 was everyone's midlife crisis, we'd live to be 120. It'd be great. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go on, Liz. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's what part of this is, you know, we're, you know, there, uh, there are four people on this, this zoom screen and maybe one or two of us are going to live to beyond a hundred. And so it is, what do you, how are you going to spend these next several years? And, you know, a blog is such a safe thing because, and I, and, you know, Joan Didion, I love, she is a writer I love and everybody's heard this line, I'm sure, but it's just like, I didn't know what I thought until I wrote it down. Mm-hmm. And so blogging did that for me. It was like the, tr- you know, you're, it, you know, I, I'm not terribly religious, but I think that's where you find your truth when you write and it just things come out of you and you didn't even know they were there. And that's kind of what happened with the blog. It just it was like, Oh my gosh. And so, and so then I just kind of laughed at myself because this is like weird stuff. And then I found that other people were laughing, but, but um, empathizing. And so that's kind of how it emerged for me. And then I, you know, it's, it's life. is such a process. Yes. Uh, my my ex husband always said that, but it's true. Um, that just one step, and and that's what I love about creativity. Um, and tell me if you need me to shut up. But no, nope. I I directed a program for eighteen years called the Jeremiah Project, and it was a pottery program. I, I'm a I was I was a potter. And I had, I, um, we had this creative expression program for underserved middle school students. They came to our pottery studio and that's when I really discovered the power of creativity because we didn't really seriously think these kids were going to make, you know, be world famous potters and sell their wares all over. We just wanted them to think a little bigger and, you know, just even coming, they were brave. They, you know, they crossed, I don't know if you know Winter Park, Florida, but it's this Tony little, you know, bougie street in Winter Park and our, my, this church where the congregational church where we hosted this um, pottery program was. So these kids crossed this street, came to a strange church and worked in a strange medium. And I just watched as one step in the creation of a clay dragon or a cereal bowl informed the next. And that's the creative process. And that's what's so cool about it. And that's why I think it's a good accomplice in our aging journey, because we don't, you know, we, we, it grounds us in the present and we're not thinking, you know, two years ahead when we, may be disabled or our husband has cancer you just, just right here right now and that will tell you what to do next and it's kind of cool mm-hmm. and so these kids I mean even like throwing a vessel on the wheel um the first step is to center it so the so that was such a good metaphor for centering our lives mm-hmm. and then you then you opened it and it was opening yourself to possibilities and then you shape it and we have the power to shape our lives. So the metaphor with creativity was just so powerful to me. I just, I kind of, I, I was just so blown away by these brave kids. They, that it just kind of created this um, love of creativity. And, and then I started writing and, and I, this all kind of came out. Do you but find I, that, that, not, that in, in order for the creative process to truly occur, a person needs to trust that people won't judge it as, you know, broken right. and useless. Is that part of losing the beige? Like it's okay. Well, you know, I've had grown, I, I do a lot of workshops um, on creative creativity. I've had women get up and leave leave the room it's like oh I'm not creative I mean they have this label in their head and it's like I'll go read a book and it kills me because I know there's a match for everybody I know there is and so I I I regularly teach a um, 
what I call an exercise, your creativity class at the Center for Health and Wellbeing here in Central Florida. And these women come, I have like 30 women in a class and we're there just to exercise. That's And, and so I talk a lot about, per, you know, perfection is one of those things that boomer women are just really hung up on. And, and to make yourself vulnerable, I love that Mark used that word, is really important because mm. it makes you more open and creativity, you know, helps you say yes and or what if instead of, oh, OK, this is the way it is. Um, and I think we I think as you age, you tend to do that. You get stuck in those notions. Mm -hmm. uh, well, but if you exercise creativity if you practice it helps open and, and it's good for your brain and it's not just me saying that but mark you were going to say something i'm sorry well, there's a there's a big difference between journaling right writing down your thoughts but publishing those thoughts that's where the vulnerability really comes out and you're putting yourself out there for criticism right yeah ultimately yeah. that's the fear of why a lot of creative people don't act on their creative impulses for fear that someone will criticize what they're doing and make them feel less valuable yeah and put them at risk yeah so why do it i'm not going to take the chance i'm just going to keep that thought in my head and i'm not doing that and if you have an editor who really makes you feel that way yeah who's <laughs> crumbles it up and throws it back at you, or you have track changes that look like somebody bled to death. Huh. Uh, that, but one, you know, I think really that's part of the process. If you can get through the editorial process, then, it, then it's like, okay, fine. I'll just be naked out here. Yeah. Uh, because it's so hard. I have never done anything as hard as having to open up my computer or my emails with those changes and questions and no, nope, go back to the drawing board. Hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah, um, and it's subjective, right? It's their opinion. It is. It is. And, and you have to smile <laughs> and say, okay, if you say so. And but they did. They're gold. Editors are gold. They make you better, absolutely. Because yeah. in, in you know, if you you know you think your stuff is great and they don't necessarily, and you have to go back and I don't understand what this means. And so there's a huge vulnerability then. I mean, huge to because uh, you are just laying yourself open. Right. And so after going through that process, the publication. And coming out, I truly was a little worried about some friends or family, but that editorial process really kind of stripped you of everything. Yeah, that's your ready. It's true. I mean, those editors, but again, um, what they're asking you to do is clarify, you know, yes, to, to clarify your point because we know you've got something in there that you want to say, but let's work on a little bit more so that it is crisp and clear. I've been through that five times i know exactly what it is it's wow it's five a, times five five wow. books and it is it is it is really yeah you you, you have to what are, what are the names of, what are the names of your books um my first book was called manager stress uh the second book was outsmarting anger won an award the third book was the fear reflex at which point my wife said are you trying to tell me something um <laughs> Then the fourth book was uh, Do You Really Get Me? And then the book that's just come out recently also won an award was Unleashing the Power of Respect, the I Am Approach. But congratulations, yeah, that's but, wonderful. But it's also, it, it is a remarkable process. So with that in mind, uh, let's take a commercial break and we will be right back with Liz Kitchens and the Dr. Joe Show. Hey, welcome back. And again, we're super grateful for you listening to the Dr. Joe Show. If you have anyone that you think might be a good sponsor, shoot us an email at drjoepodcast at gmail.com. D-R-J-O-E podcast at gmail.com. Give us your thoughts about the show too. We're wondering, are we talking to the trees or are people really gaining value in this? Please let us know. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of the show. 
And we're back with the Dr. Joe Show with author Liz Kitchens talking about her book, Be Brave, Lose the Beige, Finding Your Sass After 60. Yeah. So we're having- I a love the way you say that, Mark. Isn't I just great? love it. Well, beautiful? that's the way the that's word so... is meant to be said, I think, isn't it? Sass. I think so. I mean, right? so you get me. You just get I do. me. I love it. It didn't take long. It didn't take long. <laughs> yeah. I got you. So we're having a wonderful conversation here, folks, with Liz Kitchens. Liz, uh, you have something that you wanted to read from the book. Um, we would be delighted uh, to hear the excerpt. What you got? It's about bravery, Dr. Joe. And it's towards the end of my book, kind of a recap. And it says, I began this book preaching the importance and benefits of creative thinking. I thought I knew what it meant to be brave and poke fun at certain societal rules and expectations. That is until I wrote this book. I underestimated how owning these qualities in myself might evolve. Be Brave, Lose the Beige, Finding Your Sass After 60 started out on a linear path, but it dipped and curved and I felt my writing grow braver with each chapter revision. By sharing my formulas, I learned them too. Starting out, I did not imagine that by chapter six, I would entitle one of my sub chapters, Purses Are Like Vaginas. I got bolder in my language. I was working on my Caregivers Living in Color chapter during my husband's 2022 cancer scare. You don't have to be so polite, mom, counseled my daughter one day when I was overwhelmed by texts and phone calls with offers of help. I wove that advice into my chapter revisions. I realized I have a pathological propensity to please others and, and I don't think I'm alone. I know many other lady boomers who suffer from their own approval addictions. Did society and our parents subtly or not so subtly encourage us to adopt these roles? Or is it in our DNA to be sensitive and caring? Either way, it's incumbent upon us to get braver and set boundaries to protect ourselves and stop postponing our own lives. You don't have to be perfect in the execution of the steps and prescriptions offered in this book. Far from it. Striving for perfection is another one of those boomer behaviors that erode our color and zap our sass. Just be open and try a couple. The responses will reward your efforts. Mm. Well said. And I, I think it, it gets really right into the I am approach as well, because I, I, I think that we, we spend so much time judging ourselves as less than when we could just be exploring who we are and why we do what we do. I think it's such an important message that you send. I, I wonder whether, whether we could use that as a, as a segue to the two truths of the I am. Um, the first truth, because the four domains interconnect, your home domain and your social domain, your biological domain and the I see, the way I see myself where I think other people see me, because they interconnect, a small change in any one domain can have a big effect. So Liz, I'm just wondering, what small change can you recommend to our listeners based on what we've been talking about? I'll give you an example. Um, I was doing a workshop recently and this woman said when she turned 60, she set 60 things she wanted to do that she'd never done um, in her 60th year. And she, and they were 60 things that she, they weren't major things. It was like, go see the five museums in my town. Um, so little things like you just said, little baby steps like that can qualitatively change your life or make it or enrich it at the very least. And so take a taste, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, just step out, step outside the norm, take your shoes off on an airplane or just, where's that, that may be kind of stinky, but um, do something just a little bit outside the uh, conventions. I I have a subchapter called the three-fisted drinker. And I, I have this, I have all three drinks when I'm out 
and it's kind of it's like a glass of wine to for the inebriation and the the iced tea for the caffeination and water for hydration and so and this is something that's been picked up by family members so even this little uh, it, this idiosyncrasy of mine has inspired my family members, which just shocked me. My daughter-in-law said it liberated her beverage habits. So it could just be something as little as that. You don't have to climb a mountain to have an adventure. You can ride a bike in the rain. I mean, just something little to, and you'll just feel like you're the boss of your life. And so what small change can people do today to lose the beige? As a creativity evangelist, I'm going to encourage people to just do some creative act. Mark mentioned journaling. Um, I really do believe writing is a great way to find out what you think and who you are and what you feel um, or exercise, do some kind of exercise to, to explore this right brain of yours. The cool thing about aging is I've read um, that the hemispheres, the, you know, the very separate left and right brain, that, that line delineating them starts, there's more crossover as you age. So you actually get more creative as you age. And so if you, if you do a little bit of a practice a couple times a week, you're going to start thinking differently. I mean, it could just be try a new recipe, you know, grow some, something in your backyard. It doesn't have to be anything big it doesn't have to be intimidating um and and you'll find yourself thinking differently that's a, a great great suggestion I, I do think our our listeners can can do something creative right today you know uh, it doesn't doesn't need to be big and, and i think again i think it gets back to trust you know the i am is saying let's look again at why we do what we do without judgment. And you, you take the words, look again and reverse them. Again, look, again, look, again, to repeat something, look like a spectator. Let's respect why we do what we do without judging it. it that respect leads to value. And I really believe that value leads to trust. And with trust, we can do just what you're saying. We can unleash our unlimited human potential because we're not going to be worried that someone will judge us as less than. We have remarkable creative brains. And this, and if not now, when? Yeah. Yeah. Good, good point. And that, I think, gets really to the second truth of the I am. Everyone is interested in what you think or feel about them through their I see domain, the way I see myself, the way I think other people see me. And this has an effect on your biological domain because we all know that it feels different when you feel respected versus disrespected. And you are part of someone's home and social domain. So the second truth of the I am, you control no one, but you influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you wanna be. Liz Kitchens, also author of be brave, lose the beige, finding your sass after 60. What kind of influence do you want to be? It's a big one. It's a big, it's a big it's goal of mine. Um, I really want to help people find purpose and meaning in the second half of their lives. It's really important. If I, if this book, that, that's really a big part of why I wrote this book. I, I, I believe so strongly in the principles I talk about. And if that can impact one person that, you know, and change the way they view the second half of their lives, because now is the time for action. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we did spend so much time raising children and making, you know, paying a mortgage and, buying groceries, and now is the time. And that's the influence I would love to have is to really, because I feel so passionately about people discovering that um, as they age. It's their time. I'm in my 60s. 
Mark, you're not. Tom, you're not. How how does this resonate with you? Do you do you want to wait until you're in your sixties, or do you want to begin that meaning and purpose now? Right now, right now, and I agree with the fifties. I think there's something inherent in in turning the age of fifty. Right, you turn that calendar, and all of a sudden, it's who am I here to impress? Really, mm. nobody. Right. This is the second half. That was what I wrote down when you first started talking. The second half of life. You know, it's so important to really to to focus in on that. You know, because you only live once, and it really becomes apparent when you hit that fifty. And you know, you find yourself putting people and thoughts in the rearview mirror and looking forward in that windshield. It's cool. I'm looking forward to reading. It. That's great. Liz, thanks so much for being on the Dr. Joe show tonight. Folks, be brave, lose the bays, finding your sass after 60. Liz Kitchens, you can get it. Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, anywhere. But buy it, pick it up. It's going to really help. Thanks, Liz. Thank, thank you. Thanks for ha having me. I've had a blast. Great. Tom, Mark, see you next week. Stretch the canvas, brush the